model. That story and more coming up next. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by the Illinois chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, whose mission is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. Children's Learning Place, excellence in early childhood education since 1998. Evolve Her, a collaborative workspace for women. Kevin Kelly with Jameson Sotheby's International Realty. Luxury is an experience, not a price point. The J. Parker, a Chicago rooftop restaurant at the Hotel Lincoln. And Hollis Plyman and Company, a Jacksonville CPA firm assisting individuals and businesses with financial success. Special thanks to Dr. Daftari and the team at Arta Modern Dentistry. Cellular Intelligence. Goldfish Swim Schools of Chicagoland, Deluxe Cleaning Services, Ega Salon and Spa, Chicago Andrea Creative, and Export Fitness. Positive or negative, everyone has a mental image that comes to mind when you think about yourself. Shaping that could be the little voices you've heard from the past or subliminal marketing that floods our daily lives. Either way, that image, how you view yourself, is powerful and could change everything with a shift of perspective. We're talking self-image. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. A child from Alabama who watched his mom sew for the local factory dared to dream big. He envisioned goals and literally got to the red carpet by stitching it together himself. At one point, he couldn't afford fashion school, so he signed up for a sewing class at the fabric shop. Let's welcome out Boris Powell, fashion designer, dreamer, and doer, here to share how his self-image started from within, and now he's helping others find theirs. Well, hello there, Boris. Welcome to the show. Hi, Whitney. Thanks for having me. Your story is very inspirational because so often we think people have just arrived, and your story is not that. You worked very hard to get to where you are today. And still working hard. See, and that is a key component because you're still always arriving, I feel Absolutely. like. Absolutely. So self-image, you grew up in Alabama. Were you wealthy? <laughs> Not in the least. I, um, I was raised in the projects um, in Alabama. Parents divorced when I was two years old. Um, raised by a single mother. Um, I later found out when I went to um, university um, that she worked three jobs to um, support my brother and I um, through school. Um, so whenever we would go to sleep at night, um, she would um, run out to work a third shift, second shift job. Mm -hmm. This went on for um, ages. So I was um, very, very, very poor uh, when it comes to um, <clears throat> the what we know as wealthy and not wealthy money type. But I, I was very rich in love. Did that give you that confidence to dream big? Um, it did. Um, that was one of the things. There were so many different things. Um, one, I have to give credit to my mom. She was actually brilliant um, the way that she raised us. But we, uh, when I say we, my brother and I, um, our whole entire childhood life growing up with her, she always said, I want you to have a better life than I ever had. And I want you out of here. Um, and it's very hard for a mother to want to cut the, the wings and um, let their, um, their children fly because of attachments or whatever, things like this. But she told us from, from the very beginning that she wanted us out of the um, place where we grew up to live a better life and have a life that was much better than she had. Wow, so did you see her sewing? Is that what got you into this whole fashion world? I did. I um, I grew up with a mom that um, was a seamstress. She would um, sew our clothes when we were really little. She had a sewing machine on the inside of um, the home in our living room, I think it was. Um, but where I grew up in Alabama, um, boys were not allowed to be artistic. Boys were not allowed to sew, definitely. Um, you either had to play basketball, football, baseball. 
Um, and then some of the nerdy guys that they would yeah. call us were um, allowed to play um, in band. So oh. that was the only way that I could express myself as a creative was to get into music. Really, was to get into music as a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when did you find your love for sewing? And I think about where you are now. We're go we're getting there, but I mean, because now you're this luxury fashion designer, <laughs> and I mean, your stuff is literally on the runway, on the red carpet. But how did you get? From that little boy that was told, no, you can't even sew. Yeah. And you weren't just given the silver spoon. How did you get there? I um, I wasn't given the silver spoon, but I always wanted that silver spoon. Anything beautiful, I was so drawn to it. Um, my mom was a seamstress. Um, working in like um, an industrial manufacturer, not even sewing clothes and garments, but I do remember um, when I was able to kind of um, take care of myself after middle school, I would rush um, to my mom's um, job and um, spend the last hour in a corner just watching her and the other women um, sewing and just listening to the hum of the sewing machine. It was very calming and soothing to me. Um, that was my first memory as something that um, said, okay, Boris, this is definitely a world for you. You need to really try and figure out how to do this, even though you can't as a boy growing up in Alabama. And then on my, uh, my dad's side, my dad's sister, my Aunt Shelby, she was a high fashion model. Um, oh. And then I was around 10 or 11 and she took me to a fashion show, my very first fashion show, put me on stage as a shy little boy. Uh -huh. And I was so timid and scared, but I was so drawn to this, um, mm -hmm. this industry, all the clothes, the, the beautiful people on the stage. Um, and so those are the two memories that I had to, I would say, just keep me motivated and inspired to seek out this world at, um, at, a, at a point when I was able to. Well, and then you get to Chicago and mm -hmm. you couldn't afford fashion school. No. So you took a class. I, I mean, what a self-starter. Yeah, and um, what brought me here um, was music. Um, so I credit music to saving my life and getting me out of the um, environment that I was born and raised into. Um, so I was marching with a particular organization um, called Cavaliers, which is the Drum and Beagle Corps, here um, in Chicago. Um, and 95 is when I met my very first fashion designer. I went in um, for my costume fitting, and he had the measuring tape around his neck, his sketch pad, and he was fitting us for our costume. And then that's when it all made sense to me. Um, and I was like, aha, this is what I'm supposed to do. As a boy, a young boy growing up in Alabama, I had no idea what a fashion designer was. I thought all clothes came from J.C. Penney's, which is where we shop for my school clothes, <laughs> right. J.C. Penney's. So I thought all clothes came from there. Had no idea there was such thing as a fashion designer. Wow. So when I met Michael Cesario, it all made sense. And I decided that since I found myself here in Chicago on tour, I was going to move here and pursue um, this industry that um, I'm in now. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up that you still had to have that umph to see yourself, like you said, you always wanted that silver spoon. You always envisioned kind of this life. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Because so much of self-image is how we view ourselves. Absolutely, and I, and, and still, I think the world struggles a lot, even in today's time, no matter who you are, what age you are, with that self-image. Um, it's because we are so in tune with what society and environment tells us that we need to do, what we need to say, how we need to walk, um, and how we need to look. Um, and it's just normal to have all of that muddy water to just get into your head and just really keep you off track of, right. um, of things. But I've always, always been so stubborn about things that I want. Um, and I wasn't gonna let anything stop me um, from achieving my goals of making this world a more beautiful place. Mm. And this is what I'm here to do, is, um, is use my God-given talent to share the beauty with other people and to make them feel better about their life inside and outside, even if it's just for one moment, which is an event. And I know that my gift, um, from wherever it came from, as, um, is to share my art and beauty for other people. Um, and that's my purpose. Wow. And so no matter what I do, I have to, and even in the trying times, the most difficult times, I still have to create beauty for other people because that's what I was put on earth to do and I recognize that. Yes, and you first create beauty for yourself. Like yes. Being able to look internally Absolutely. and you give it out. And when I started designing, um, it hasn't even been that long, 10, um, 11 years ago is when I took my first sewing class. I've been doing it um, this coming December will be eight years full time. Mm -hmm. But I sort of, I, I told myself um, 11 years ago that I'm designing for three people, me, myself, and I. There's so many different entities oh, that make yes. up who I am. And I've only learned to recognize and appreciate um, those um, 
with age. Um, and now I, I really appreciate all different sides of me, and I design for all of those different characters within myself in hopes that um, I am t I'm touching a bit of everyone. Oh, and you are, and speaking of which, you won some awards. We've seen your stuff on the red carpet. I mean, what's next for you, just to keep on pushing on? Yeah, you know what, I, um, I know that I'm here just to make clothes, right? Um, and to entertain people at the same time through my clothes um, a lot of times. And so I can't say, you know what, oh, here is in five years, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm doing what I need to do every single day. Mm -hmm. There's not a day that I'm not doing what Boris Paul is meant to do. I work seven days a week. And I love it. Um, my social life doesn't, <laughs> but I, as an artist and a person that understands what um, what my purpose is, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, you you won't find the day where I'm not trying to get to the next. And the next is a dress, a suit, mm. or a handbag. Um, and you don't know who that's for. Or I don't know who it's for, but I know it's for someone. So. <clears throat> My next thing is a fashion show. My next thing is that next garment. Um, and it's just that circle of life that is just like a revolving door and it's just constant for me. I'm designing, I'm dressing, and I'm dressing people, I'm dressing people, I'm designing. And that's, that's just and, my life. And it sounds like just circling around your purpose. So yeah. that is awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Boris, for coming on. This is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's now time for our viewer's voice where we want to engage with you and we want to hear what you think about today's topic. So get ready because today's question is, how do you view yourself? I view myself as a very open and growing individual, always taking things and learning from my experiences and really listening to and understanding the views of the people around me so that way I can continue to shape my own. I view myself as any true Leo does, confident, creative, and pretty driven, maybe a little lazy at times, but I'm working on it. Um, I just, you know, take life day by day. I don't stress or overthink anything, um, you know, and I'm just doing the best I can. And I think that, you know, everybody is. Get social with us. Make your voice heard. Submit your video on WhitneyReynolds.com. And speaking about how you view yourself, the movie I Feel Pretty also addressed this topic head on. We sat down with Amy Schumer and A.D. Bryant and have more about this new release. What was it like when you found out that you were being cast for this movie, I Feel Pretty? Well, um, when I said yes, I think they were excited. <laughs> no, um, no I, I was told about the script and then I had an offer and I, um, I was like, that sounds great. That's the exact message I want to communicate right now, so it was perfect. Yeah, and you're a producer on the film, so that was yeah. a big part of, mm -hmm. yep. of all of it. Being a producer on the film, did you change some of the stuff? Did you say it oh, needs yeah. to be more of self-image? Yeah, for sure. They were very cool about collaborating, you know, because mm -hmm. ultimately it's the director's decision, but the, like the bikini scene was written for me to just stand there and pose, and I was like, no, I'm doing a whole dance, and uh, and I added the moments where I'm like standing there and like Spanx and looking in the mirror and just kind of taking myself in. And um, so, yeah. You both are just such a great duo with this. How do you both personally feel pretty? I think um, like it's a constant process, but knowing where your actual worth comes from, you, you become kind of victim to all the advertising and marketing and then what sort of society to make money has made you feel like you need to fear and work harder to look different and be different. And then when you realize, I feel the best when I'm with my friends or my family and I love who I am and I feel confident and it has nothing to do with how other people experience you. So just reminding ourselves that and then yeah, you'll have a bad day and be like, well, this isn't the only day. I'll feel better tomorrow. Right. How about you? I mean, 100%. I agree with Amy. I, I definitely, there are days where I feel low, but most of the time I feel pretty good about myself. And yeah. I think that's a learning thing that you learn to do. Yeah. Now, I believe you are just a powerhouse. You're a confident woman, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, have you ever had self-image issues in your career? Honey, yes. I mean, everybody, I, not just my career, just your life, you know? I remember going to college and you're... Um, you know, high school, you kind of figure out who you are there and then you're gone and you're in this new world. And OK, where uh, where's my worth coming from? It seems like a lot of people are, um, you know, sort of rewarding 
women for being hot. And that's the thing. Okay, well, that's where, and then you realize like, that's not true. And this stuff is so fleeting. And you don't want to surround yourself with people that care about that. You want to be with people who love you. At the end of the movie, your character fully steps into owning who she is. She realizes that everyone loved her. You in the movie loved her for who she was. I mean, mm. true blues right there. <laughs> and um, for you, is that is that what you want people to walk away with? Oh, absolutely. Just feeling better and not striving for some other version of themselves, like actually loving who they are right now and not being, you know, just just being their own advocate and, and loving themselves like they're their own friend, you know, or their own mother. Like how beautiful you see your friends, how you want them to see themselves. Like, well, see yourself that way too. And I just think it's a feel good movie. I think you'll walk away feeling better, especially with how like insane everything is right now. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Raji Airy is a woman who encompasses today's topic. Adopted from India and polio survivor, she has had quite the journey to get to where she is today. Her tough times have made her extremely strong, not only for herself, but to be a voice for others. Well, I feel like we have a super woman on the set that is just changing the landscape for marketing and women out there and when it comes to body image, self image, internal image. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. You grew up in India for a short stint mm -hmm. and were actually put up for adoption. I was, yeah. So I was born there and then um, contracted polio when I was, um, they think I contracted polio around like four or five, probably closer to four. Um, and then I was adopted at age five and then I came to the U.S. Right, at, uh, right after I turned six. And you had polio. Do you think that is why your mom put you up for adoption? Absolutely, yes. So my parents gave me this piece of paper when I was um, actually leaving to study abroad for J term in India my junior year. And um, the piece of paper literally said, this widow can no longer take care of her sick child and her many other children. Um, so I'm assuming, you know, as difficult that is for a mother to give up her biological child for adoption, I think, you know, she thought, well, she's going to have the proper medical care and a better future mm. um, than what I can provide. And the polio, in case our viewers don't really know, because this was, you weren't vaccinated, so you contracted mm -hmm. polio. Mm -hmm. And polio affects people differently. It does. And for you, it took over kind of your leg region? Yes, so it does. It, it can affect people um, either in their lower extremities or upper extremities or their whole bodies, actually. Um, but for me, it was my lower extremities, so my legs. Um, and then my right leg was more affected than my left leg was. Mm -hmm. um, but initially, both my legs, I, I couldn't, I, they were both atrophied and I couldn't walk. Wow. Um, but then I had a surgery when I was in 10th grade and the doctor was able to actually take my hamstrings and make them into quads so I could <laughs> use my left leg. And wow. With that leg. Well, that is amazing yeah. in itself, taking some other muscle and putting it somewhere else. Now, and you still use crutches to walk today. I do. Mm -hmm. um, but really, you've been told that you wouldn't be able to walk today. To, so to be using crutches mm -hmm. is nothing shy of a miracle. Right. So you come to the States mm -hmm. and you um, are in a wheelchair at this point, mm -hmm. and But you still have this confidence as a kid. Like you didn't, you didn't let anything stop you. Right. Yes. Where did that come from? I think that if you internally um, view yourself a certain way and you're, you know, you think, okay, I'm just like everybody else. I can do everything else, you mm -hmm. know? And yeah, of course I had struggles, right? Every right. kid does. And, um, but then I also, I just overcame so much so early on in my life. I think that that's kind of where this um, fire inside of me, you know, comes from and the confidence and, and all that. Well, and you also are walking with courage knowing that you were hand selected in a sense, like your parents wanted you not only a little bit, but they went over to India to go pick you, you yeah. know? And that had to give you some type of strong support system to know, man, I'm really loved. And I feel like as family and friends of people, we can give people that support, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in our own way to lift others up. Right. And I, and I, recognize it's a huge transition for the family right because I also have siblings I had a brother and a sister who was they were my parents biological kids and so it was a transition for them to be like oh now we have this other kid in our in our family um, but also they the whole family itself my aunts uncles cousins everybody you know really um, 
just gave me this warm welcome and really made me feel like a part of the family for my whole life. And so, um, but with that, they, you know, there is, I think, this internal struggle um, that I had, I think, at, at times because, yeah, my, it wasn't by a lot, my biological mother and father that raised me. Um, but I also recognized the older I got that they gave me the like utmost proper, you know, childhood that I, or, you know, life that I could have right. ever possibly wanted and gave me so much unconditional love as if I was their own child. Right. And so. you are not just, um, your life did not just stop there as like have being a strong child. Let's just go forward with where you are now because you went through this time where you said, okay, I'm turning on the TV. I'm watching. Yeah. And I'm not seeing anybody that looks like me. Yeah. And not only did you see that, but then you did something about that. Yeah, so it was the first time where I felt like I didn't fit in. Mm. I didn't like, I didn't know where, where my place was. And um, I think it, it was really hard because I had all these surgery scars on my legs. I, you know, didn't feel beautiful. I ended up, um, you know, being like, well, I want to go into the media and I want to change this perception because I wasn't reflected. There was not only somebody that didn't have a disability, but nobody that, that was South Asian. I just didn't see that. And I said, well, society needs to change and be more reflective of the society we actually do live in. Right. And I, you know, went off to college, got my degree in broadcast journalism, graduated when the economy was terrible, um, then just freelanced and worked in, you know, various spokes modeling and production gigs. And then um, decided, somebody said to me, well, why don't you do on camera? And of course, because I didn't see anybody represented, you know, in films and TV and magazines, I was like, well, I can't be on, on camera. So that, that thought actually did go through your head. Yeah, absolutely. That you, you couldn't do it because you thought, well, I don't see that. Right. I realized I had to also advocate for myself. And so when I found out about the, the area was doing a casting, I obviously submitted myself for that. And then I was so surprised when I got selected because I was like, well, you know, this is my chance to really show girls and, and women that you can, you know, put yourself out there and be confident in who you are. How did you navigate through being comfortable letting those that side of you show? Initially, when I first saw the images, um, I, you know, I would think it, it was overwhelming in the, in the sense that it was, I mean, they were beautiful, obviously, but I also realized, wow, I'm completely exposed and the whole world can see me. Mm -hmm. And I had, a, I think, a brief second of insecurity, for, for mm -hmm. but then I realized, no, like, this is truly who I am. And, you know, my scars and um, all my, ins uh, you know, things that I'm insecure about, are what make me who I am and I'm a survivor and I've gone through that and those are all the challenges that have um, helped to build my confidence and overcome all these things that you know I I've experienced in my life right and so if other people can see that and they are like wow this person put themselves out there then I can do that or I can be more accepting of who I am mm -hmm. and my body um, I think that's that was like kind of the goal. And I think I achieved that based on the responses I got. So. You definitely did. <laughs> and you still are changing the landscape. It's amazing when we can be bold with who we are mm -hmm. and own who we are. It really changes how we go out in the world when we know our inner confidence. Absolutely. So. I mean, you ha the strength has to come from within. And, um, you know, you have to, whether that's, that's literally like looking at yourself in the mirror and telling yourself affirmations of, mm. I am beautiful, I've got this, I can go conquer the world, I can, you know, live out my dreams and achieve my dreams, you know? Right. And so, so. Shine bright from the inside. Yeah. Out. Well, thank exactly. you so much, Raji, for coming on and sharing your story. Of course. Thank you for having me. I hope today's topic has helped you see you have the power from within to view yourself in a new and great way. Good and kind self-image is a gift that you can give yourself. For more information on today's show, go to WhitneyReynolds.com. Go beyond the interview with Whitney Reynolds and her 52-week guide of inspiration. The book goes deeper with the stories you see on The Whitney Reynolds Show. To order your copy for $12.95 plus shipping and handling, 
go to WhitneyReynolds.com backslash store and use code PBS. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by the Illinois chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, whose mission is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. Children's Learning Place, excellence in early childhood education since 1998. Evolve Her, a collaborative workspace for women. Kevin Kelly with Jameson Sotheby's International Realty. Luxury is an experience, not a price point. The Jay Parker, a Chicago rooftop restaurant at the Hotel Lincoln. And Hollis Plyman and Company, a Jacksonville CPA firm assisting individuals and businesses with financial success. Special thanks to Dr. Daftari and the team at Art of Modern Dentistry. Cellular Intelligence. Goldfish Swim Schools of Chicagoland, Deluxe Cleaning Services, Ega Salon and Spa, Chicago Andrea Creative, and Export Fitness.